Great. Well, good morning, and thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. Uh, let me see here. Uh, from Apollo to Artemis, NASA's last and next missions to the moon. Did you know that in 2022, it marks the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 17? And did you know that the Apollo 17 was the last manned lunar landing flight? And did you know that NASA is planning the first full-up test flight to the moon? And are you aware of Artemis, which marks NASA's upcoming return to the moon? Uh, with the goals to land the first woman on the moon and establish a permanent lunar presence. And I think we're, da we're days away from the launch, hopefully. Uh, so today we're joined by NASA Solar System Ambassador Len uh, Rabinowitz, uh, a retired high school history teacher and a lifelong astronomy enthusiast in a discussion of lunar missions from Apollo 17 to Artemis. So all 50 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Len for joining us here this morning. And Len, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name, excuse me. <clears throat> my name is Len Rabenowitz. I'm a NASA Solar System Ambassador. Uh, I should be clear, this is a voluntary position. I'm uh, not an employee. I'm not paid. We just... Uh, do it because uh, we love space and astronomy and uh, uh, we want to make sure that people are properly informed about these things. Uh, I am a retired history teacher, uh, spent most of my career at uh, Ashland High School, uh, where I always tried to, uh, I taught mostly American history, I always tried to integrate American uh, contributions to uh, science and astronomy and space uh, exploration. The required curriculum doesn't get into it much. Uh, it's sort of a little bit of greatest hits. You get the, uh, the Soviet uh, uh, Sputnik is mentioned, and then something about, you know, uh, Kennedy saying we're going to the moon, and then all of a sudden you got Apollo 11, and then all of a sudden a, a shuttle explodes, and then that's about it. Um, and I always thought, well, there's a lot more to the story than that. Everybody's heard of the Hubble telescope, Nobody knows who Edwin Hubble was. Well, my kids uh, learned that kind of thing. Uh, and I got a little bit distraught uh, because while most students didn't believe conspiracy theory stuff, uh, growing numbers did. And more kids knew more about that stuff than they knew about what actually happened. So I, I always tried to integrate uh, some of it. Uh, and this year is interesting because, of course, it's the, the uh, 50th anniversary of the last uh, crewed flight to the moon, Apollo 17. And of course, they're, they're, it'll get off the ground eventually, but it's going to be the first of, of the uh, uh, Artemis uh, flights uh, marking return to the moon. So I thought it was an interesting kind of bridge and comparison there. So um, I'm going to skip some of the, the pre-Apollo background uh, to it just in the interest of time. <clears throat> Project Apollo was the, the crewed uh, flight, uh, uh, flights to the moon. Late 60s, early 70s, it was a three occupant vehicle. <clears throat> the initial uh, crewed flights, Mercury was single occupant. Uh, uh, Gemini was dual occupant. Uh, this was determined that you really needed three people to go two on the surface, one stays in, in orbit. Uh, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me, the earlier flights had just demonstrated that in fact, we could get people into space, uh, tested out the uh, uh, sort of mechanics of things that were necessary. Could you have two vehicles meet in space and, and connect? Could people operate outside of the vehicle? Could they, could they do work? Could they be in a space vehicle long enough, which was, you know, in essence, two weeks, uh, a few days out there, a few days on the surface, a few days back. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to see any of these vehicles, which, you know, they're in the Smithsonian uh, for the most part. <laughs> they're not large, okay? They're not large. And could we design a, and build a vehicle powerful enough to get off the surface of the earth and, and do all of that? 
So uh, Project Apollo ran from the late 60s to the early 70s. It's a three occupant vehicle. The purpose was explore the moon. Um, they did uh, uh, have some idea of using Apollo for uh, post-lunar, it never really happened. But there was at least one proposal uh, to send an Apollo spacecraft actually to both Venus and Mars, not landing, they would be flyby missions. That never happened. <clears throat> um, there were a couple of Apollo flights uh, that were non-lunar flights. Uh, afterwards, uh, Apollo vehicles uh, were used to uh, launch uh, the Skylab space station. And there was the uh, Apollo Soyuz, uh, you know, Soviet American link up uh, that was done in the uh, uh, mid 70s. The Saturn V was the most powerful rocket ever flown. And at this moment, it actually remains that. All right, seven point million pounds, five million pounds of thrust. The uh, space launch system, uh, as soon as it flies, will take that record because it's eight and a half million pounds of thrust. Uh, the Saturn is interesting because it's the first rocket built for strictly non-military purposes. It's, it was built entirely for space exploration. The earlier uh, Gemini and Mercury flights and some of the satellites and everything that were launched it's kind of an interesting uh, swords to plowshares uh, thing. They took uh, Redstone and Atlas and, and Titan uh, rockets, uh, which had actually been designed to launch nuclear weapons and repurposed them for spacecraft. Kind of a nice, you know, like I said, take it from warfare and use it for uh, peaceful exploration. But the uh, Saturn V is the first rocket, first American rocket, the Soviet ones may have been different, I, I don't know. Uh, first American rocket designed strictly for uh, space uh, exploration. And the picture there is, of course is of the uh, launch of Apollo 11. <clears throat> the uh, Apollo landing sites, all right, I'm sure, uh, 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 Everyone knows about Apollo 13, which is the one that uh, had an explosion on board uh, on the way out to the moon. So uh, it, it went to the moon, but it never uh, landed. The, uh, uh, first of all, the landing sites were, uh, the landings were all done during the, the lunar daytime. In fact, in the lunar morning, okay? They wanted the sun low on the horizon, which would, put the least stress on the, uh, uh, the lunar suits when they were out on the uh, uh, surface. Uh, there was, and we never landed on the lunar far side, which I think there was a proposal, some thought to do that. I think that also would have been on the lunar daytime. So it would have been new moon uh, for us. Uh, it was scrapped because it was uh, too dangerous, considered too dangerous. Um, uh, and also the program was cut. The Chinese have landed a lander on the far side, uh, which is really pretty fascinating. Um, they all tended to land around the lunar equator. Okay, I'm not sure why, but that was considered the safest thing to do. The early flights tended to land in these, these dark flat areas. Okay, that was obviously considered safer. All right, 11, 12. The later, 15, 16, and 17, did go into, they were more confident by that point. Uh, so they did go into some riskier mountainous areas that were more interesting uh, geologically. <clears throat> and one thing that comes up sometimes, it is not possible to see uh, any of the equipment that was left on the surface from Earth, all right? You would need a telescope the size of a football field to do it. Uh, even the Hubble telescope does not have the resolution uh, uh, to do it. Uh, the stuff is just too small. I don't know if any of you have ever been uh, to the uh, uh, Smithsonian uh, and you've seen, they, they have one of the uh, 
I think it's a lunar lander that obviously was never flown, but I think it's one that was used for training purposes and they have that there. That's the biggest, that, that landing segment of it um, <clears throat> is the biggest thing that's on the surface. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's only maybe 15 feet across or something. It's, it's just too small. Um, the, so it, it's not possible uh, to, to uh, see any of the, you can look at the landing areas, of course, but to see any of the equipment that was left, it's, it's just too small. It has been photographed from lunar orbit and I'll show you some of that. The uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, located and photographed I think the orbiter is, all, is at about 60 miles above the surface, I think. Uh, and even that close, it was with high resolution cameras, it was hard to find this stuff, okay? So at any rate, uh, that's, the, 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 that's the landing areas. They're sort of grouped into this one uh, uh, area. The upcoming Artemis flights, um, there, and particularly with, there are three that are in the, in the pipeline now. I assume that there will be more beyond that. They're gonna go into a much uh, wider range of, of landing areas. Most particularly, they wanna go to the South Pole because uh, believe it or not, uh, water has been detected. Frozen water has been detected at the bottom of some of the craters uh, at the South Pole. Well, that's a game changer because of course water can be used to drink. Uh, it can be separated into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, use for fuel, all right, to breathe, all right, so they're really curious to get a look at that. Okay, now, uh, Apollo 17, uh, it's the last lunar flight, it was, I believe, December 1972, so you're coming up uh, on the uh, uh, 50th anniversary of it. Uh, it's the only nighttime launch of a Saturn V, which I'm going to show you in just a minute. Uh, if anybody ever invents a time machine, get in touch with me, because boy, I want to go back uh, and see this, okay? Um, and please, uh, you should be able to see it and hear it. Uh, let me know if, if, uh, uh, if you can't. There's no sound for the first few seconds, and we're not going to watch all 15 minutes of it. pressures, temperatures, they can override the terminal sequencer if they uh, cite a problem that it has not picked up. We are on that terminal sequencer when, now. When I was a kid watching this, there, there was just nothing like the, these old countdown guys on the terminal sequencer. Uh, to build up some, some tension. At the T minus 50 second mark, we'll be looking for that critical power transfer. This is where we transfer from the external power source, which has been feeding the three stages of the launch vehicle to internal There's, power. There is no off switch on this thing. Once you fire it, uh, you're going. Space vehicle. It's expected. My brother had a company that worked on, there were a couple that were flown, that were built and never flown. His company worked on restoring one of them, the one that's in Houston. Said it's essentially a gigantic gas can with a match at the bottom. Light it and run. And yeah, I can believe it. That uh, given proper weather conditions, People will be observing this flight from as much as 500 miles away. This includes a large portion of the southeastern United States, the northern tip of Cuba, and the Bahama Islands. Now approaching the two minutes, two minute mark. Mark, T minus two minutes and counting, and the countdown continues to move along smoothly. In the uh, terminal over the air broadcast, no, no the cable TV. The automatic sequencer has stopped the replenishing of the liquid oxygen and the liquid hydrogen. We are standing by uh, now to one of the fuel tanks, the second stage fuel tank pressurized, third stage fuel tank pressurized. The countdown continuing to move along smoothly. T minus 90 seconds. T minus 90 seconds. Countdown continuing smoothly. S4B propellants uh, pressurized. The indication now using the workaround showing the S4B propellants have been pressurized. Now looking at the liquid hydrogen tanks as uh, they become pressurized. 
LH2 aboard the second stage, pressurized. All propellants now aboard the second stage, pressurized as we approach the one minute mark in the countdown. Mark T minus one minute and counting. Now in the final minute of the countdown. At T minus 45 seconds, Gene Cernan will make the final guidance alignment. This is the uh, Mark, T minus 45, and Gene Cernan made that final guidance alignment. That's the last action taken by the crew aboard the space vehicle. Now approaching the half minute mark. T minus 33, T minus 30 seconds, and continuing on now. Continuing on at T minus 26 second mark, T minus 25. We'll get a final guidance for release at the T minus 17 second mark. So when it's terminal, like no stopping, but something like 10 seconds. And then, nine, eight, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, one. They must have been able to see that for hundreds of miles. Five million pounds of thrust. I'll, I'll run it through a, a staging. Wow. Okay, babe. Let's check the angle. 30 seconds. We're going up. Man, oh, man. 30 seconds and uh, 17 is go. Checking your go. Okay, one minute, 68 degrees. Okay. Everything looks great over here. Today. Okay. Okay. Stand by for Max, coming through Max 2. We'll be at 68 degrees. Okay, okay. Okay. Stand by for mode 1 Bravo. Mark, mode 1 Bravo. Roger, 1 Bravo, we're going one minute. Team, you're looking great. Right on the line. Okay, we've got the RCS command. Team, you have feet wet, feet wet. Roger, feet wet. It has to get up to six, orbital six, speed, oh, yeah, which is 17,000 miles. Stay down there, Q meter. And then to leave Earth, it needs a, a further boost in the last stage up to 25,000 miles. 130, about 50 degrees. 50 degrees, okay, right on. 130, and we are go, Bob. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Good. Two Gs. Two and a half Gs. See, it quiets out after Max Q. Yep, quiets out. Push three Gs. Okay, you're an old man up there anymore. Yep. <laughs> okay, we're out of Max Q. Okay. Cabin's still looking good. Alpha's BC. It's interesting. Okay, so Most of the fuel on this is Charlie. being expended, one lifting one other one fuel. Roger, one Charlie. Two minutes. BDS is off, and we are gold. Three feet. 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 you get uh, uh, the idea there. Now, um, <clears throat> Gene Cernan uh, is the last man on the moon. He died a few years ago. Here's a, a thought for you. Of the 12 people that, that walked on the moon, uh, only four, I believe only four remain alive. Um, Aldrin is still alive. Uh, uh, he's 91 or 92. These guys are getting old and they are, they are passing on. I'm not sure offhand who the other three are. I think Harrison Schmidt is still alive. I know uh, uh, Jim Lowell is still alive. He's in his 90s. He is the only person to fly to the moon twice and never walk on it. Uh, he went to the moon on Apollo 8, which was an orbital flight. And he, went to, he was supposed to walk on the moon on Apollo 13. Um, 
uh, obviously that one didn't land. He was, I think he was offered Apollo 17 and his wife kind of said, oh no, <laughs> no, you're done. Um, Gene Cernan died a, a, a few years ago. Uh, now, of course, it's routine. Virtually all the astronauts that they send up there are scientists and engineers and, and uh, uh, whatnot. Uh, Harrison Schmidt was the first uh, and the only scientist uh, sent to the moon. He's a geologist, later uh, uh, elected senator, I think from Colorado or Utah. Um, they did spend, this was the, uh, 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 the lengthiest time on the moon, okay? And this photograph is rather fascinating. Uh, color in space, I'm an astrophotographer also. Color in space actually gets pretty hard to determine because uh, it depends on how you see it and how it's lit and, and how it's photographed and everything. So determining the, the color of the lunar surface was actually, it's mostly kind of grayish, brownish, uh, was actually one of the purposes of uh, the missions. And they would bring along these color palettes that looked to me like those things they used to show you in a hardware store or a paint store, whenever you're trying to match the paint for your house. Um, but that gave them a reference point, okay? <clears throat> one of the discoveries that they made was uh, uh, this uh, uh, orange uh, regolith. And by the way, that's the proper term for it. Uh, you'll hear sometimes people say uh, uh, lunar soil. Well, soil is really kind of biological. There's, there's no biology there. Uh, or, or lunar dust, which is maybe a better term, but it's, it's not the same as the dust that's under your couch in your living room. Um, the closest uh, analogy on earth is probably actually beach sand. The stuff is actually like these little glass uh, silicates, mostly formed from volcanic eruptions early in the moon's history or, you know, gigantic uh, meteorite impacts and, and, and whatnot. It's actually rather dangerous. They were very concerned about the astronauts getting it in their lungs. Uh, if they brought it in uh, to the uh, lander or about it getting into the equipment. It's still a concern, all right? Some of the astronauts reported that it smelled like gunpowder and did report kind of, uh, you know, having a bit of, they, they cleaned themselves off before they got back in the, the lander, um, but having a bit of an allergic reaction to it. Um, Apollo 17 discovered the orange regolith, re remnants of a volcanic eruption three and a half billion years ago. All right. Uh, you know, that's one of the kind of mind blowing things about that is that when they went to these areas, uh, that some of this, this, some of these areas had been undisturbed for millions, even billions of years. So you, you're getting a, a uh, a picture really of uh, the early history of the solar system and the early history of earth. Uh, you know, people had to still wonder about it a bit, but people have wondered how, you know, how did the moon form? Okay, well, it turns out they were able to determine it formed from something gigantic smashing into the earth and basically knocking it off. <clears throat> um, this is also the only complete video we got of the, the uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of the uh, uh, liftoff from the lunar surface. Um, what they did was that the last three flights, 15, 16, and 17, had a rover with them. Like a, they used to call it a, 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 a solar powered go-kart with beach chairs, okay? Which is a pretty good description of it, actually. And of course it had a, uh, a, a camera on it. And just to be clear, there were actually no quote unquote video cameras on the moon. The cameras that they brought were still cameras, film. So they didn't see the still pictures taken. They couldn't see until they got it back to earth and developed it and television cameras. So you got live, what we saw was a live television broadcast. Uh, and of course that was recorded on earth. 
Okay. Now in this lunar liftoff, what they did was that they um, they positioned the rover at a distance uh, from the lander and pointed the camera at the lander. The camera was actually remote controlled from Earth, okay, to track uh, the uh, upper half of the lander uh, as it launched. Um, and the guy, it, it, uh, the moon is about 238,000 miles away. At the speed of light, it takes about a second, about a second and a half for the image to go from the moon to the Earth, and then for commands from the Earth to go back to the moon. So there's about a three second you know, round trip delay. The guy had to uh, account for that uh, in, in controlling it. They tried this on 15 and 16, it didn't come out quite right, but here on 17, he gets it. And uh, one of the things you hear, well, if it's, if it's a rocket, you know, how come you don't see any exhaust? Well, it's easy because they used what was, they wanted the simplest, there's no repair stations there. If this engine doesn't work, they're stuck. They will die on the surface of the moon. They wanted the simplest engine possible. So they use what are called hypergolic fuels, which you don't have to ignite. They ignite on contact. So all you had to do was mix the fuels together and you're gonna go. Um, if the engine didn't work, I'm not sure that there was anything. They might've tried some things, but at any rate, so this is the only complete video of a lunar liftoff. Four days. Four days. Four days. Engine arm is out there. Okay, I'm gonna get the pro. 99, and you'll see, you, three, you, you see the two, explosive one. bolts, but that's it. Ignition. Right away, Houston. That's your grid. And you that's see he's right. able to track it. Good Take over. over. I tell you, you have good thrust. Okay, 30 seconds. 308, your number. And at any rate, that's that's all I've got of it uh, uh, here. I remember as a kid, uh, the the camera continued to broadcast until basically the batteries died or the you know electronics um, uh, were fried. I remember as a kid watching it and say, "Man, the moon is pretty boring. <laughs> Nothing happens. It's just this gray rock." Um, NASA has said that they actually would like, it's not on the schedule for these first three missions, but they actually would like to return uh, to some of the old landing sites uh, and study what, you know, what's happened to the stuff out on the surface. Uh, sometimes people ask, could you, could you fire up the rovers again? Very doubtful. Those rovers have had 50 years of uh, being exposed to radiation and you know, 500 degree temperature swings. That's probably fried the electronics. But surely you want to study what's what's happened um, uh, to materials left out on the surface for that long. And uh, you know, decades ago, some people started to talk about you know, you need to do some things to legally protect those sites. Uh, because, you know, you don't want somebody going back to the Apollo 11 site, grabbing the flag and selling it on eBay, uh, you know, which would be an incredibly stupid thing to do. And NASA was always kind of dismissive of that uh, until about 10 years ago. Um, I think it was Google. They canceled this, but they offered a prize to the first company that could land a rover near one of the landing sites and photograph it. Uh, and... Uh, they eventually canceled this. I think it was called the Google X Prize, something like that. Uh, but NASA said, whoa, we better do this. And they did, you can find it online. They did uh, issue guidelines for approaching uh, uh, the landing sites. Basically, you're not to disturb them. You're to, to keep a certain distance away. Um, uh, I think there have been proposals in, uh, 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 in Congress about legally protecting the sites, sort of like the national parks, but it actually becomes tricky because legally, uh, because the property that's there, the equipment remains the property of the United States government. 
but we're a signatory to uh, what's called the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, uh, which basically says uh, no nation can claim a heavenly body as its own. No more, you know, no more imperialism. Okay. So in fact, which, but what it means is that we can't pass laws legally protecting like the, the rover tracks and the astronaut footprints and the general site uh, uh, of it uh, because they're not ours. Uh, I cannot think that anybody would be stupid enough uh, to disturb those sites, but it is a, 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 a bit of a legal uh, uh, conundrum. And I think you will see in the, upcoming decades, lunar tourism. I would take a flight to go and look uh, at, at the Apollo 11 landing site. And you guys can come with me if you want. Um, at any rate, okay. The crew <clears throat> in the picture, that's Gene Cern Cernan seated. Uh, that's one of the rovers. I don't know if it's the, uh, uh, it might be the rover that they took with them. They had some for training. Uh, there is a training one uh, in the Smithsonian and it, it's quite something to look at, the wire mesh tires, and it's, it's maybe the size of a Prius. Okay, you can see the tracks, but you can't see the rovers. Um, uh, <clears throat> he flew Gemini 9, okay, and Apollo 10. Apollo 10 had to be the most frustrating flight of all because it was a full dress rehearsal for the landing. Uh, they took it down to about 60,000 feet uh, above the surface and then of course aborted it and uh, uh, it was not to land. Uh, and then uh, it's a full dress rehearsal. Apollo 11 was actually considered uh, the first landing attempt. Uh, they, the astronauts gave it maybe 50-50 that it would all go as it did. Uh, on Apollo 10, the fuel was shorted, all right? He didn't have enough fuel to land. That was that was not to prevent the astronauts from hot dogging it, uh, which they would never have done, but it had to be a realistic simulation. Lifting off from the lunar surface and the, the gravity is kind of weird on the moon. Uh, they wouldn't have had a full tank of fuel. You had a fuel tank, full tank going down, all right? But of course you expend fuel landing. Uh, so you, they took off with approximately, um, on 10, they gave it approximately the amount of fuel that it would have launching from the lunar surface because that was a more accurate uh, picture of how the uh, uh, equipment would behave. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, so Cernan um, commanded Apollo 17. <clears throat> Ron Evans is uh, right rear, uh, the balding guy. Uh, he was the command module pi pilot. So he's the guy who stayed in orbit. Uh, in the uh, uh, Apollo uh, capsule, they had quite an experience because when they're on the far side of the moon, and just to be clear, there is no dark side of the moon, uh, all sides of the moon receive uh, the same amount of light. Uh, it's the far side. He's completely cut off from literally everyone. All right. He could not see. We got the television broadcast. He can't see that. He has no contact with Earth, no contact with his compatriots uh, uh, on the moon. And they, you know, they were busy, of course. He had to fly the craft and they did experiments and everything. But the guys who did that, the, I guess uh, seven of them, or well, a few more because of Apollo 13, uh, talked about that being a pretty weird experience. Because uh, out one window you had just black nothing, right? You could you were a, it was the moon, but it's almost completely black. You really couldn't see anything. And then out the other window is of course this enormous sea of stars out into infinity. Um, some of them reported the radio picking up some weird sounds. I don't really know uh, what. To, what they were, probably just background noise. All of the command module pilots you say, you know, well, if the guys died on the surface, would the command module pilots have come back? 
okay? And they all said that they would. They knew that they would be kind of marked people forever because most people wouldn't understand why they couldn't rescue or anything like that. But uh, fortunately, none of them had to do that. Um, that's Harrison Schmidt, left rear, geologist, lunar module pilot, uh, the only scientist to go to the moon. Uh, odd thing, the lunar module pilot is actually not the, I don't know why this happened. It's actually not the guy that landed the lander on the moon. That was the commander. Um, but I guess they were doing other things. I, I, I don't know. I've never quite figured out uh, crew assignments uh, on, on these flights. At any rate, that is the three of them. Okay, now the Apollo 17 mission. First of all, that that is one of the photographs uh, from uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And even with high resolution cameras close to the moon, you can see, you can barely see it, okay? Uh, that is the, uh, the descent stage of the lander from Apollo 17, okay? Uh, you can see it pixelates and, and everything. You can see the rover tracks. Some of the other ones, they, they managed to find all of them. If you just Google Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, which is still orbiting the moon, uh, it's mapping out potential landing sites. Uh, they got all of them. Some of them you can't see the astronaut tracks, <clears throat> but these are the, uh, uh, the, the rover tracks. That's not actually the flag you can see, it's the flag shadow. Maybe you can see a little bit uh, of the flag, but even from close to the moon with a high resolution camera, it was not easy to find these things. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the Apollo missions had been scheduled uh, to go uh, through Apollo 20. First uh, 20 was canceled, then 18 and 19. And I can explain this. This, we sometimes, you know, conspiracy theorists or whatever say, well, you know, how come, you know, they canceled and we haven't been back? It's not complicated. Uh, it was expensive. Uh, Apollo 13 showed it was dangerous. Those, in a sense, those guys on Apollo 13 were lucky. They were lucky that it happened when it did in the flight. Uh, I have read things saying that if that had happened at any other point in the flight, they would not, certainly after, they used the, the lander as a lifeboat. So if it had happened after the lunar landing, forget it, they're, they're all dead. Uh, uh, they're, not, they're not coming back. Um, and even at other points prior to the landing, uh, there was very little room for it to be successful. So this was, was dangerous. Uh, it was expensive, and I was a teenager that followed this in the 1970s. The political and financial support for it, the public support for it just evaporated. We had met the goal by Apollo 12, the next one. Uh, people were complaining that reruns of I Love Lucy were being interrupted to show the moon landing. And people say, why are we doing this again? All right. And we had Vietnam and inflation and Watergate and civil rights. And it just, the program never had huge popular support. It was always about 55% or so. The support had just evaporated. Even Kennedy, before he was killed, it's kind of sad. Kennedy never saw that we did it. He died at the end of Mercury, basically. Even he was getting concerned about the cost of the program and actually proposed going to the moon with the Soviets. Let's do it together. Uh, Khrushchev initially rejected that, but then later on he accepted it actually, but Kennedy had been killed. Kennedy might've done it. Uh, and Johnson never responded to it. So uh, 18, 19 and 20 were canceled. Uh, Nixon did approve uh, the space shuttle. Okay, which was sold as a more cost effective way to get into space. I don't think it really turned out that way, but it was launched uh, December 7th, 1972. It returned on the 19th. It is, it's the longest uh, lunar mission exploring the Taurus Latro uh, region, which was a more interesting, it was kind of mountainous. And I think there were also some valleys and whatnot. Um, uh, it was more interesting geologically. 
three days on the surface, uh, which, which means that, you know, they, uh, they had to sleep on the lunar surface and not literally on the surface, but uh, the lunar lander was not a five-star hotel. Uh, the, the Apollo 11, the early guys, they just found space on the floor and that the, uh, the lander was noisy. There was no sound proofing. Everything was cost and weight. So if you didn't absolutely need it, there were no chairs in the lunar lander. They stood up the whole time. Uh, I think these last guys, they put a couple of hammocks in there, but uh, noise in your, you're on the moon. You're not gonna relax very much. Uh, they did travel furthest from the lander. All right, so they took the most risks. Uh, with the, uh, uh, the rover, uh, they had to do, they could only travel as far as what was called the walk back distance, okay? <clears throat> There's no repair or ref refueling in space. We still can't do that. I think Gateway, uh, the later Artemis missions are gonna start to address some of that. We still really, the shuttle could, the shuttle could do some of this, but we don't have the shuttle anymore. Um, but certainly at this time, there was no capacity for rescue, no capacity for repair or refueling or anything. So if something broke, that was it. So if the, if the rover malfunctioned, the furthest they could go was however far that they could walk back. And, and uh, that was determined by the consumables, water and air uh, that they, they carried with them. Uh, if they had to go to the bathroom, <laughs> there's no service area. Uh, you went in the suit. Okay, um, Buzz Aldrin is the first person to pee on the surface of the moon in the suit. Uh, the other end, you just went in the suit uh, and they had special uh, diet that they use, very low residue to try and uh, uh, avoid that, okay? Um, <clears throat> so they could only go as far as they had the consumables to walk back. Um, and I think this one went about five miles uh, 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 from the lander, I, I, I think. Uh, the lunar suits, however, five miles would have been quite a walk. Uh, the lunar suits were cumbersome. I think the later ones had a better design, but the earlier ones, they talked about the gloves being um, uh, kind of stiff and that some of them actually getting kind of bleeding in their fingers from uh, working with, uh, with the gloves. Um, <clears throat> lunar gravity is one sixth of earth. So you weighed less, but you still had all the same mass and they had the portable life support system on, the, on their backs. Uh, and visibility on the moon is weird. There's no atmosphere to scatter the light. Um, so the surface is actually very bright and reflective. But in fact, in the areas that they were, it was rather flat. So that if this was a bit of a danger driving the um, uh, 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 rover, that all the craters on the moon, and we tend to think of the big ones, but the small little ones, some of them you really couldn't see until you were basically on top of it. Uh, uh, it would look flat and then you'd be, you know, until you were like right next to something, say, oh, it dips down five feet. So it would have, uh, it would have, it was dangerous enough to drive the rover. Uh, I think a walk back would have been very dangerous. And then of course, what if, what if one of the astronauts fall over? Uh, my understanding is that the regolith is actually slippery. Sometimes people say, well, how come the boot print on, on the moon is bigger than the astronaut's shoes? Because they, they put on, I can only think of them as, as galoshes. When they went out on the surface, they put um, something over uh, the, the shoes, basically, that they were wearing, which had those tread, much greater tread to give them greater traction uh, on the surface. And my understanding is that it had about a couple of inches of regolith on top, and then it's actually hard uh, underneath. But and some of them did fall over. Uh, they were able to get back on their own, but one worry was if somebody falls over because he slips, do you send the other astronaut to help him? Because that could give you two astronauts down. 
never happened. A couple of guys that fell over were able to, uh, uh, to get back uh, on their own. It's the largest sample return, 254 pounds. <clears throat> we have about 800 pounds of lunar material brought back much of which actually uh, hasn't been studied yet. They released, I think, about 50 pounds of it at the time of a, uh, the early Apollo flights. But then the rest of it, and it has to be preserved in vacuum. Um, <clears throat> the rest of it uh, was held on to <clears throat> um, uh, figuring, and they were right, <clears throat> that we'd have better studying techniques later there was the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. There was more that was released. Uh, there was some that was given as gifts to heads of state and some that was distributed to museums and whatnot. I believe there is some that is missing, okay? And I know there was at least one attempt by a former NASA employee to steal some of it, to give it as a gift to his girlfriend. Uh, or something of, of that nature. But most of it is still under lock and key. And of course, with these new missions, we'll be getting new uh, samples. And yes, five mice were brought along. They didn't bring them down to the surface. They wanted to study the impacts uh, on uh, um, uh, of space you know, exposure and whatnot on living tissue. One of them died uh, during the flight. Uh, the other four survived the flight, but they had to be autopsies to be studied. Uh, so they sacrificed in the name of, of science. Uh, and they didn't really find much in the way of adverse effect um, at any rate. Okay, now some of these images, all right. Um, the flag is not flapping in the breeze. Uh, the two poles snapped open and the lunar surface is actually rather hard. Um, so they had to kind of twist it in and that's what gives it the motion, but or the, the appearance of motion. You look at the video of it, in fact, it stays absolutely still. I love the one of the lunar rover because uh, one, on, on this particular mission, yeah, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the dust guards, those were actually important uh, on the tire uh, because it, it had to keep the dust off of the main components of it. And uh, I guess something went wrong, it broke or it came off or something. And so they actually used some tape, they had paper maps, okay? They actually just taped some maps to the top of it uh, 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 to you know, kind of repair it. And I guess that worked. Um, so I just think that's a wonderful photo. All this high tech and yet it came down to, to duct tape to, to fix it. Uh, the one to the right of that, I love it because you, you, you get the <clears throat> seeing on the moon is strange. One, the moon is one quarter the size of earth. So the horizon is much closer, but there's no atmosphere. So there's no atmospheric distortion of anything. So judging distances is really weird. And those mountains, uh, I don't know the exact distance, but apparently they're much further away than they look. But of course you have, <clears throat> you know the size and scale uh, of the, the rover, okay? But you have this, this gigantic, this, apparently this boulder is really gigantic, much, much bigger than it looks like the size of a house. <clears throat> so judging a, a, a scale is, is uh, quite odd. And then uh, I love this photo of the uh, guy outside of the spacecraft. On this particular one, I don't know if the other flights did this, the film canisters were stored uh, uh, in the service module, not in the actual Apollo command module. So he had to do a spacewalk to get the film uh, canisters, uh, which were, they had these special storage units. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, the, uh, it's the furthest a spacewalk was ever done from the planet Earth, right? Because they're, they're uh, uh, you know, traveling back and forth uh, to the moon, okay? How am I doing on time? How much, uh, I wanna keep this to an hour. Uh, to an hour. 
Can somebody pipe up and just say uh, uh, how much time I've got left? I don't have a clock with me. Yeah, so Len, um, you, uh, we're, we're closing in on noon. Okay. Um, it's 11.55, you know, oh my. if yeah, we go well, over, it's okay, Len. Uh, Len. I, I would say try to wrap up your presentation in the next 15 minutes, and then okay, we'll take sure, some questions. Sure, yeah. sure. I, I get excited about this stuff. I can tell, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so cool, you know. All right, now the Space Launch System. Um, it is, it's, it's NASA's newest heavy lift launch system. Uh, this initial version of it that they're going to try and launch on Saturday, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust. All right, so that is more powerful than the Saturn V. Saturn V is taller. It's, Saturn V is taller than the Statue of Liberty. This is a little shorter. I'm not sure how much. Uh, the Saturn V is a full three-stage rocket. Uh, this is being done differently. Two solid rocket boosters and one main core stage. Uh, that'll get it to orbit. And then there is a second stage that'll get it out of, of Earth orbit. Um, the first configuration can put, we call it 60,000 pounds to orbit and beyond the moon. Okay. There are later configurations that will have nine and a half million pounds of thrust and lift over 100,000 pounds. Uh, that's why it's not reusable. Right now, uh, people talk about the, you know, reusable, reusable, and they're right. In the end, that's where everything is gonna have to go. The issue now, however, is that the reusability adds weight because you need fuel to land the rocket. Uh, you need the landing struts, you need the guidance systems, and uh, um, it'll be developed eventually. I know that's what the Starship is uh, uh, working on. But right now, this thing is all about muscle power. This is all about getting a lot of payload uh, out of Earth orbit and to the moon. And it, we just don't have, it's just not feasible to, uh, to do it. There is some reusability to it. The Orion capsule is considered partially reusable. And of course, it's reusing uh, shuttle engines that have, this will be the last use of them, but they've been used 20, 30 times. And I believe the, the boosters are modified shuttle boosters. Uh, they've been extended some. Uh, they tried to launch it on, on Monday. I gather the problem was with cooling one of the engines. The fuel that's used is extremely cold and you have to cool the engine before you put the fuel in it or it will just crack. Okay, so they're gonna try again on Saturday, right? <clears throat> the initial uh, block one configuration, okay? Four RS-25 engines, uh, two solid rocket boosters, okay? And the, the uh, core stage, which is mostly, is mostly a fuel tank, all right? It looks like the shuttle fuel tank uh, because it's covered with the same uh, foam uh, insulation, okay? That's basically what will get it all off the surface of the earth, okay, uh, and uh, into earth orbit, okay. And that's, it, that's uh, these are not uh, reusable, that's, it's single use. The second stage, uh, it'll be like the old Apollo flights. They'll do an orbit or two to check everything out. And then the uh, second stage is what'll get it out of earth orbit. All right, it's got a 17,500 miles an hour for Earth orbit. You need 25,000 miles an hour to break Earth orbit. Okay, but then again, that will be expended uh, once it's on its way to the moon, basically. And then um, the top, you have the service module. Okay, uh, there are some adapters. Okay, the crew module. That's the only thing that does the whole trip and that is at least partially reusable and the launch abort system. So it looks very much like the old Apollo system. If, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, okay? Um, this is the initial configuration. There will be, assuming it's funded, there will be a, a later uh, configurations. Now, the uh, spacecraft, all right, superficially it's similar design as Apollo. It has to be, because you need to get through the atmosphere. It's just physics. 
to get through the atmosphere, you want a pointed tip, okay? Uh, and then you need the blunt end to get back, okay? To, uh, you know, ablate the heat and absorb all the heat, all right? Uh, it has some reusability. Of course, the heat shield can't be reused, all right? It's also just, Apollo was designed for kind of quick and dirty, all right? This is designed for much longer missions. All right, this first uh, uncrewed test flight, is gonna be a month or right? maybe longer. Uh, they are looking to this uh, to do possibly flights to Mars. It's designed for deep space operations, okay? Um, <clears throat> and uh, it's gonna be going, you know, the, the electronics on this are much more advanced. People talk about the Van Allen belts. All right, it's not a problem getting people through the Van Allen belts. We, we just blocking uh, the radiation, we did it. The astronauts didn't receive any more than you'd receive, uh, uh, you know, in a few visits to the dentist really. Um, uh, there was it was higher than that but it was nowhere near uh, anything uh, lethal but this is taking a different path it's going in, in apollo they the, the the van allen belts fluctuate all right there's two belts and they they fluctuate the van the apollo flights took a path through the weakest areas of them at times when they were weak we understood them pretty well by that point and the electronics were much simpler uh, on Apollo. This is much more advanced. And the, uh, the electronics are much more miniaturized and that miniaturization makes it more susceptible um, uh, to radiation. So that's one of the things they'll be, be testing, okay? It's just a matter of, of shielding, okay? But they wanna test it uh, before they put people on, on, on board. Um, there was one test flight of the Orion uh, prior, which did some of the testing, but this is the full up entire thing, okay? They actually have mannequins on board that have like fake human organs, basically, not real ones, fake ones. They wanna test the, uh, uh, the radiation shielding, but they'll figure it out. It's, it's, we did it before, we'll do it again. Um, and then I guess I'll end it here and take some questions, all right? The first flight, okay, um, it's an uncrewed lunar orbit test flight, but it's gonna go way beyond where Apollo orbited. That furthest reach of it is gonna be about 4,000, this is not really to scale, it's gonna be about 4,000 miles beyond the moon, okay? So it's doing a huge loop around the moon, okay? Initially, they thought it might launch in June, but uh, when they did the, the fueling test, that showed some problems. None of this is unusual um, uh, in, in space flight, okay? They launch when they're ready, all right? The shuttle had plenty of launch delays, the Apollo, all of them. Artemis II will be uh, the first crewed flight to go into lunar orbit, scheduled, I think they're talking 2024, 2025, um, the lunar landing flight will be Artemis III, which they're talking 2025, 2026. Uh, first woman on the moon, first person of color. I think they wanna try landing in the Southern Pole area. Okay, that's my uh, understanding of it. Long-term, they wanna build the lunar gateway, which is basically putting a space station in orbit around the moon, okay? The current uh, International Space Station is coming near the end of its operational life, okay? Um, there are discussions about a permanent lunar colony, a lunar base, and then you use that as a stepping stone to Mars. The expense comes from getting off the surface of the Earth, okay, and the, and the Earth's gravity. If you can launch from space, if you build the infrastructure to launch from space or launch from the moon, you put that investment in, then you, you cut your, your uh, and the moon has resources, uh, you cut your expense way down because you don't have to, the moon has one sixth gravity. Um, 
So I hope the thing, uh, 215 Saturdays, when the launch window open up, opens up, uh, they wouldn't schedule a, a, a launch if they weren't confident of it, but uh, who knows, it can be affected by the weather. And I hope everybody watches, because when this thing goes, boy, is, is that gonna be a sight to see? Uh, and I guess that wraps it up. I'm sorry to go long, but I get excited about this stuff. And I'll, I'll take questions for a few minutes if there are any. All right, Len, uh, great job. Uh, let me scroll over to the Q&A here. Okay, so, uh, okay, we're gonna delete those first two questions. Uh, okay, the third question is also irrelevant. Yes, so folks, I do realize that my photo was um, blocking a portions of Len's screen. We tried to work that out beforehand and uh, Len couldn't see me on his screen. Um, so there was really no way to fix that. But it looks like it was just a minor inconvenience. Okay, so um, we have a question. What will the new lunar, lunar settlement be like? What will be done to get uh, protected from radiation? I don't really know, uh, uh, to be honest with you. I think um, I can try and, um, if you'll maybe send me a reminder. Uh, I think any plans for lunar settlement are very sketchy at this time and subject to change. Um, I know that part of the plan is that the, uh, uh, the SpaceX Starship, okay, is supposed to be uh, the reusable lander back and forth between Gateway to any bases that are down there. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll try and find information on what the current uh, proposal for any kind of base or colony is. Uh, uh, I have to think it's pretty sketchy at this point. Uh, radiation would be a matter of shielding, uh, but I'll try and find out more about that. I have read some things about uh, building a lot of it uh, under the surface, which would provide you with uh, uh, protection. But I have to think that anything uh, at, uh, at that point, um, uh, at this point, is, is pretty sketchy. And of course, it's dependent on funding. Right now, you know, the, the funding is for three Artemis flights. And the, the other, you know, uh, SLS rockets are under construction and everything. So it, I think you'll, as these fly and presumably are successful, then you'll see more uh, concrete uh, plans about that. But I'll try and find some information. Uh, follow up, uh, could there be unknown diseases on the moon? What will people do to be protected from them? And should we even go to the moon because of the risk of uh, unknown diseases? It's extremely unlikely, okay? Uh, I can tell you in the early Apollo flights, the first two, 11 and 12, uh, they put the uh, astronauts into quarantine for a couple of weeks when they came back. Uh, they dropped it after uh, 12 as it, it just was, was pointless. If for no other reason than if there were any pathogens, uh, uh, it would have gotten out when the you know, they land in the ocean and the, the Navy divers go and open the, the, the hatch to get the astronauts out. That's exposed to the air. So putting them into some kind of quarantine, it, it was more for public relations. There has uh, never been any indication of anything living or, or uh, 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 viral or whatever uh, on the moon. And what I've read about it, and it's, it's comparatively little, is that if there were anything like that, the most likely thing is that it, if it was truly totally alien biology, the most likely thing is that it couldn't interact with us at all. Um, of course, if, if, you know, since they found water, that does bring up some possibility. Um, and I, I'm assuming that that will be checked for, but uh, I don't know what would be done uh, if that were found, but I would say that the risks of it are enormously unlikely. 
Uh, Francis asks, from both a cost and a safety perspective, would it make more sense to perhaps stop sending people and just send robots? I think that's a decision. Um, that's a good question. And a lot of people ask it. There are proposals out there for this. Um, I think that's a, that's a question. It's almost a political question, actually. You know, the American people fund this. Uh, they have to decide uh, if that's what they want to do. Um, you know, as, as, as a kid, when I was watching this and, and, you know, I've met some of the astronauts and, and whatnot, uh, it's just jaw droppingly amazing. Mm -hmm. um, you can make an argument that, that people can still do what the machines can't. Uh, On-site decision-making. Uh, people can have inspiration and insight that a machines can't yet. Would a machine, for example, on the uh, lunar rover, the one I showed you with the maps taped onto the tire, would a machine have thought of that? I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I can't answer it, actually. It's a wonderful question, but that's, in essence, the voters will have to decide it. Um, certainly, it's uh, safer uh, to send uh, robotic missions. Uh, is it more cost effective? I'm not so sure on that. Maybe. Uh, but the aspects of exploration and of just uh, human decision making and decision making on the spot uh, and just excitement and national pride and whatnot, I think people have to decide that for themselves. And obviously, NASA is sending people in these three missions and I'm here as a representative of them. So of course I'm supportive of it. Uh, it's a deeper question, uh, one that we'll, we'll have to make. All right, a few uh, questions on Artemis. Uh, we talked about this one before we uh, started. Uh, Joyce asks, how likely will the canceled Artemis launch actually occur on Friday? Uh, it's scheduled for Saturday, actually, Saturday, 215. Uh, I don't know likelihoods offhand. I can, you know, the, the main variable is uh, always the weather. Okay. And, uh, you know, I, I think NASA actually has the same, you know, the National Weather Service. I think they use the same weather mm -hmm. prediction that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they wouldn't have scheduled if they weren't at least reasonably confident of that. Although, of course, it, it can change. Um, my guess, and that's all it is, is, is uh, probably still 50-50. Uh, launch delays are, are uh, very common. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, there are some things, I was reading about this. Uh, NASA tends, like SpaceX tends to assemble, the, and God bless them, they do fabulous things, but they do their testing differently. They tend to assemble the rocket and test it by launching it, which means that in fact, that they get a very high failure rate, which is good. Uh, 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 Elon Musk has said that those failures are important. NASA, you got a multi-billion dollar rocket here and you've got three that are paid for. So you, you don't wanna test it that way. Okay, you don't want to launch this thing and have it blow up on, on a launch pad or, you know, blow up five miles high. NASA tends to do all its testing in the design and construction uh, 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 phases, which is where you get these cost overruns and delays and, and all of that. They tend to do comparatively little full up testing once the thing is uh, 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 assembled. Um, Having said that though, there are some things that cannot be tested uh, until you say, all right, we're gonna try and go. And I have my understanding is that was part of the problem here. So I would still put it that they're not gonna schedule it unless they're reasonably confident that it's gonna go. My guts are telling me it's still probably 50-50. Of course, but that includes, you know, what the weather does, which we're sitting here on Wednesday could 
change a lot in, in, in three days. Mm -hmm. So it will eventually go. It will eventually launch. There's, there's no doubting it. But the shuttle, that, that, that contributed to the, the delays. That contributed to the, the um, uh, Challenger explosion because mm -hmm. it had been delayed and delayed and delayed and uh, mm -hmm. people got frustrated and they just launched it when they shouldn't have. Uh, they learned a lot from that. Okay, so my guts are telling me 50-50, but it could mm -hmm. be better than that. And everybody should watch. And uh, I'm gonna combine questions here. Okay. Uh, Ann asks, why is it called Artemis? And an anonymous attendee asks, uh, for Artemis, will the crew once again only consist of three people? No, um, Artemis, all I know about it is it's the sister of Apollo. Mm. Um, so that's why the name was chosen. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, 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 you know, it's not just scientific exploration. There are cultural and political and social things. One of the important uh, uh, things here is to send the first woman uh, uh, to the surface of the moon and the first person of color. Those are important uh, uh, goals for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, NASA went through some criticism that you know in the earlier days, it's not true anymore, of course, but in the earlier days, it was all white men. That had to do with using test pilots and the pipeline into it, and that's, that's a complicated thing. Uh, so Artemis is a sister of Apollo. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, Orion craft can, uh, can hold four, actually. And I, I think uh, that it is somewhat configurable. So it's a large, it's a larger craft than Apollo, uh, and then the early designs wanted six actually, but I think the redesigns of the uh, they've got a better toilet than the old Apollo guys, uh, cut that down and maybe payload capacity cut that down, so it can currently currently hold for some of the I think some of the I hate to call them plans because I don't think it's that solid. But for post, uh, uh, you know, the long term, I think it's maybe for a, a larger crew uh, complements, but currently it can hold four. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so we are uh, at 12.15. Um, couple more questions, but uh, I think what I'm going to do, let's hold those questions. We actually, Len doesn't need, I don't think Len even knows this. We have another talk on Artemis coming next Wednesday. So I'm going to write these down uh, and uh, we can will forward, make... You can forward me questions. Okay. Uh, you want to do that as well? Sure. And, uh, I'll, try, I'll try and get answers to them. In fact, All I right. know there was one I said I would look up answers and then I can't. Oh, it's about uh, the, the base that they built. I'll see what I can find. Right, Anything like that's pretty sketchy at this point. Gotcha. All right, so we will uh, we'll wrap up here, folks. Uh, Len, do you have any last words for the group uh, before we uh, end the session? Turn on your TVs, NASA TV, and probably the, the cable channels, you know, sure. 215 Saturday. All right, be there or be square. So thank you so much, Len. Uh, folks, sure. look for an email for me tomorrow with the recording, with the feedback survey, and with information about our next three uh, solar have, system ambassador programs. they program. have further questions, yep. just forward them to you, and they can forward them to me, and I'll see what I'll, and you can forward it to me, and I'll, I'll see what I can do. All right, yep, I'll, I'll make sure to mention that in the email tomorrow. So thanks sure. so much, Len. Uh, thank you all for watching. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. All right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Yep, thanks, Bye. Len. Bye. Sure.